Welcome everybody to the special INACAL webinar of the 2012 State of the Nation K-12 Online Learning in Canada. We've got some outstanding speakers to share information about what is happening with K-12 Online Learning in Canada. And so we're glad that you can join us today to listen to this presentation. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michael Barber from Wayne State University who will share a little bit of the background of it and then introduce the other panelists. Hi, right, thank you, Rob. Uh, appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to uh, share this with uh, uh, the participants. I guess most of these would be coming through the recordings. Um, giving you a, a bit of a sense, um, first of all, before I get into the report itself, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsors for the report. Uh, the report is published each year for the last five years by NACL, and this year, um, Open School BC um, were the ones who did all of the copy editing and the desktop publishing uh, for the uh, actual report. And then LEARN, uh, Heritage Christian Online School, and Learning Mate were uh, all um, gold level sponsors, and FLVS Global is a bronze level sponsor. And without these sponsors, the, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this report year after year because it's a substantial undertaking. And, and so we really appreciate the fact, and many of these folks have actually been involved with this report for a number of years now, and uh, we do appreciate that support. Um, as I mentioned, the report is, is five years old now, and um, well, as you can see, we've uh, kept the cover relatively consistent, minus the uh, color change at the top of the year. Um, you can access all of the report material along with uh, each of the reports at the uh, URL at the bottom at that Wikispaces um, uh, site there. And uh, in addition to the reports there, we've got things like um, profiles on each of the, the provinces that are taken essentially from the reports. There's a uh, annotated bibliography uh, that is, I think, about three years old now. I think it was in the 2010 report, so the red one there, that was the last time that that was updated. Um, but that was essentially um, going through and picking all of the uh, K-12 online learning literature that we could find related to uh, the Canadian context and providing annotations for that. Um, so that's a, a useful resource for you uh, if you want to go and check it out. Um, diving right into the report, um, I'm going to talk about first some trends uh, related to the regulation of K-12 online learning and then a little bit about the activity. Um, for the most part, there is some legislative reference to distance education in almost every single province and territory, um, but in most instances, it's a line or two in the Education Act or the Schools Act at the provincial level that says the minister shall have the ability to regulate distance education. And in some instances, that is basically all that is, uh, is taking place. Uh, we've got Michael Camuel here from Quebec, and, and they're a good example, actually. In the Schools Act, there is a line that says the minister shall have the ability to regulate distance education. And within the, the context of Quebec, there is no regulation for distance education whatsoever. Um, you know, so just because the minister has the ability to do it doesn't necessarily mean that they do. Now, in many instances, actually in most instances, I'll be honest with you, they, they do do it. Uh, Quebec and Saskatchewan are the only places where there isn't much in the way of regulation, there isn't any regulation. Uh, in most jurisdictions, what you tend to find is that the ministry has a, a contract or a policy handbook that all of the participating partners have to agree to in order to be involved or to offer distance education in the province. A um, couple of exceptions to that, um, Alberta would be one um, where really the only reference to distance education comes from the secondary um, principal's secondary administrator's handbook where uh, there's this lovely little paragraph that says if you're going to run a distributed learning program as they refer to it, you need to consider and it lists off all these things like you know how do you vigilate exams, what constitutes attendance and you know what kind of supports provided to the students at the school level and and you know it's a list of about eight or twelve things and then sort of finishes off and says we have no guidance as to you know how to go about doing any of this but these are all the things you need to figure out in order to, um, before you start to run your program. The other two big exceptions are, are Nova Scotia and British Columbia. Uh, Nova Scotia actually has it written into the uh, contract that the government has with the Teachers Association or the, uh, the Nova Scotia Teachers Union um, in terms of there are 
telling them off the top of my head now. I think it's 17 individual clauses that look at distance education. Most of it focuses upon things like workload, quality of life, professional development kinds of issues. So not a lot of regulatory type things in there. Um, BC would be the, the other exception in there. Um, and BC by far is the most heavily regulated of any of the provinces. Um, there are significant um, references both in the Schools Act and in the Independent Schools Act related to distributed learning. And I'm sure Greg will talk a little bit about this later on. Um, but uh, everything from quantitative to qualitative audits that are performed, uh, funding aspects that, that um, come into play because BC is the only province in Canada where the funding follows the student in terms of where they're getting their education from. Um, you know, so those are, are just, I guess, some of the, the, the trends that you're seeing and it, it's been changing over time. I mentioned that Saskatchewan is a jurisdiction where there isn't much in the way of regulation and that's actually been a change since we started doing these reports. Um, when we first started to do them, they actually had a system in place that was very much like you'd find in Manitoba uh, in terms of both regulation and the nature of the activity. And about three years ago, the ministry decided that they were going to get out of the uh, business of providing distance education and regulating distance education. And uh, right now, it's, it's entirely up to the individual district programs that are there. Um, Looking at the, the nature of activity, as you can see, just about every single province and territory has something that is occurring. Uh, the two real sort of exceptions to that are Nunavut and Prince Edward Island. Now, not that students can't access distance education there, uh, just that they don't have any of their own internal programs. Uh, but like you'd see in the United States, um, you have a great variety of the types of programs that you would provide. Um, Leslie, I believe the slides end up getting posted in one of the iNACO forums and I'll post them as well onto my SlideShare uh, website so you should be able to access them there. Um, and the recording and the slides are usually posted in, in one of the iNACO forums. Um, you know, from province-wide programs, so for the American context, it go, uh, you know, with the statewide programs to district-based programs um, and then variations in between uh, several provinces have sprung. Uh, private school programs, and again, Greg is representing one of those, so he could talk uh, much better to that than I suspect I can, particularly with the BC context, but I know he's also been involved with partnerships in Alberta and Ontario, um, and probably somewhere else that I'm leaving out off the top of my head, not counting the international stuff. Um, in terms of, of the growth, we've seen, um, you know, significant numbers. And when you consider the fact that Canada has a tenth of the population or 10% of the population of what you see in the United States, actually I think it's about 12% of the population we see in the United States, um, you know, these numbers are actually, you know, fairly impressive when, when you consider them. Um, a couple of caveats here. Um, first, you know, the numbers in many instances are best estimates, and I'll talk about that in a second in, in the next slide, um, which is why it says estimated number of students. The other thing is that within the Canadian context, the vast majority of people that provide these kinds of numbers aren't including um, blended learning students. And, and Michael is actually a great example of this in, in his program with LEARN because um, it, of that last year, the 245,252 students that we have, I think there are 350 that come from LEARN because there are 350 students that learned at a distance. However, Michael uh, had, I think it was 150,000 students that were engaged in some aspect of blended learning through the resources that LEARN provides and, and the partnerships that he has with a number of the school districts um, in Quebec. And, you know, that 150,000 isn't included in there. But if you were to include it in there, all of a sudden now that goes up to 400,000. Um, in Ontario, there are significant numbers of, of students that are learning in a blended fashion. The same thing with uh, New Brunswick and Newfoundland. Um, you know, but when you look at the numbers, the, the Canadian Teachers Federation number at the, the top there from 99, 2000, um, that roughly corresponds with when Tom Clark was doing his State of the States uh, report. And at the time, he estimated there was 40 to 50,000. You know, so with a tenth of the population of the United States approximately, we had half as many students as them involved in distance education. So proportionally, we were much better off. And even now, um, you know, I think IMACO's official numbers for the number of students engaged in online distance learning is about 2 million. Um, you know, we're over 200,000, which is, you know, a little bit better than a 
a tenth of what uh, you know the INEACL numbers are for the U.S. So in terms of the proportion of students actually involved, you know we're doing quite well in, in, in keeping pace. Um, oops, that didn't move over. Looking at it from a, a provincial standpoint, um, you know the level of involvement province by province varies significantly, as you can see here. Um, folks out west seem to be doing quite well with this. You can see that uh, uh, British Columbia has, you know, over 12% of their students are engaged in, in online learning. Um, Alberta is over 10%, actually over 11%. Uh, you see Manitoba is up there almost 5%. Uh, for that matter, so is the Northwest Territories. Uh, whereas everyone else is in that, that you know, 3% or less range. Most of them in the 2% the or less range, as you can see. Um, you know, in many instances, that's a problem with counting. Um, and so if you look at the Ontario numbers and the Quebec numbers, and for that matter, as the Nova Scotia and, and Newfoundland numbers, uh, you see the tilde in front of them indicating that those are approximate numbers uh, because we don't actually have uh, firm numbers for any of those jurisdictions. For that matter, the Alberta number is, while it's given as a firm number, it is really just a best guess. Um, New Brunswick, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and British Columbia are the only provinces that actually give exact numbers. Um, you know, and I, I trust the numbers that they actually have provided. So the territories also do a pretty good job of it as well. Um, in terms of, I guess, sort of the national takeaways um, from the report, and this is more not necessarily of just the 2012 report, but of doing this over the last five years, um, you know, it's obvious that distance education at the K-12 level in Canada continues to grow. Um, one of the interesting things that we see north of the 49th that we don't see in the U.S., and for that matter in a lot of other jurisdictions internationally, is that uh, correspondence or paper-based education still continues to be a prevalent form of distance education. Um, almost all of the adult education provided at the K-12 level, so all the GED programs and, and other initiatives that are designed to allow adults to get a high school diploma, tends to be paper-based. A lot of the uh, court distance education that's provided to elementary school students continues to be paper-based. Um, it's really only the high school students that have the majority of their uh, distance education provided in online format. Similar to most jurisdictions outside of the United States, blended learning tends not to be seen as in, in the same way it does in, in the U.S. context. In, in the U.S., you always hear the term online and blended learning. Um, once you leave the United States, it, it tends to get seen as really effective technology integration. You know, this is just the next step that teachers, classroom-based teachers are taking to integrate technology into their classrooms, to use these online tools and the online content that's provided. Um, again, also unlike the United States where unions have tended to be resistant, in some cases um, outright against online learning, um, in Canada they've tended to be pretty cautious now um, in terms of their support. I say cautiously supportive because you know, the whole purpose of a union is to protect its members uh, against their employer, essentially. And most of the Canadian unions really don't have a good sense as to what online learning or distance education really means in terms of what that looks like for a regular teacher. You know, the, the question I often get asked, you know, when I work with a lot of these unions is, you know, what constitutes a school day? Um, you know, what, you know, teachers are expected to be in the building, say, from 8 to 4, and I mean, while we all know that they do more work beyond that, that it's not an expectation in many instances, um, you know, but even things like most school districts have policies surrounding um, professional development, surrounding uh, preparation time and those types of things. What is the online equivalent or the distance equivalent to those kind of things? And, and they don't have good answers for those yet. Um, which is why you've, you know, they, they don't quite know how to get their heads around it. So while they're supportive of the idea, um, they're still cautious about that support because they, they really don't know what it means uh, for their members. 
And, you know, some of the, the jurisdictions we're looking at have seen really dramatic changes over the last five years since we've been doing the reports. And in all honesty, if you were to go back a couple more years from that, um, you know, and BC is a great example. If you were to look at the last eight to ten years of, of distributed learning history um, at the K-12 level in BC, you'd see significant changes in the way it's been governed and regulated and funded. Um, you know, so it, it's much like you're seeing in the United States, although I mean, the drivers for it are very different. Um, there isn't that that for-profit corporate um, sense that's really driving the, the Canadian context. Potentially one of the reasons for that is that there's only one jurisdiction, being Alberta, that actually has charter schools. Um, and even in that context, there are no online charter schools uh, there. And, and the charter school movement within that province um, really just doesn't see online charter schools as being something that they would even welcome into that environment. Um, so that's sort of, you know, the, the, the report in a nutshell. Um, you can go through and each of the way it's divided up is, is by province and by territory. And I could have done a, a presentation like that, but it really would be sort of rehashing um, the two or three page versions that you see for each of the provinces there. What I think is probably more interesting and more useful is to actually get some folks who are on the ground, um, you know, working in these jurisdictions under these regulatory environments. And um, I've invited three to join me today. Uh, Michael Canuel is the uh, uh, CEO of LEARN, which is based in Quebec. Um, LEARN is, is a um, private organization in terms of it's not actually uh, a K-12 organization, but it partners with all of these K-12 districts. So. Um, it provides some direct distance education, primarily in a synchronous fashion, but then partners with numerous school districts to um, allow them and their teachers and students to use the ample amounts of content that they've got developed, uh, both for their own uh, programs and in a blended fashion. Um, and it, Michael is working, obviously, in Quebec in a jurisdiction where there are no regulations, um, I think much to his chagrin. Um, you know, so he comes from that kind of background. Uh, Vince Hill is the uh, principal of uh, Credenda Virtual High School. And uh, Credenda is based in Saskatchewan in, in Prince Albert, if I remember correctly. Um, and it's an aboriginally focused program. So unlike Michael and Greg, who would be following, uh, you know, a provincial curriculum, um, Vince actually doesn't fall under provincial jurisdictions because uh, First Nations in Canada are aboriginal. Um, falls under the federal department of, of Indian, actually I'm not even sure the official name, but now it used to be Indian Affairs and Northern Development, although I think that they probably reworded that title again now. Um, so Vince sort of has a, at least in terms of the operation of his program, a more pan-Canadian view um, because it's not tied to that provincial context. Uh, Greg, who I've, I've mentioned a couple of times in the presentation, is coming to us from uh, British Columbia. Um, Greg is the principal of Heritage Christian Online School and actually a couple of other spin-off initiatives that they've been doing in British Columbia, including some interesting work internationally. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, Greg also has been working with partners I know in Alberta and Ontario. So and Heritage Christian School is an independent school or what we would consider a private school. Um, you know, so we've got, you know, Michael who works with the public districts, Vince who's working, you know, with the, the federal government, and then Greg who is coming from the, the private uh, side of things as well. So that's sort of, I guess, my, my general introduction of them. I'm going to give them a chance to sort of introduce themselves, and you get a sense as to why I picked them um, based on the way I've introduced them. And I'm sure they'll have a, a little bit more to tell you about themselves and their programs, and then... Uh, uh, as it stands right now, we've just got Leslie as a, uh, an audience member, although Jeanette and Rob might have some questions for them. And if not, I've got a couple that I'd like to throw at them. But um, I'll let the, the gentlemen introduce themselves first, and then we'll take some questions from the group. Um, uh, we'll go from east to west, I guess. So we'll start with you, Michael, and then go with Vince and then uh, Greg. Thank you, Michael. This is Mike Canyon here from uh, Learn here in Montreal. Uh, I think, Michael, you've covered a lot of the, the basic points. Maybe just a, uh, a little bit of clarification as to uh, uh, who we are and what we do. Uh, um, Learn is a private, non-profit uh, educational organization. 
we work with both the private and the public school boards uh, and schools uh, of Quebec uh, in the English community uh, primarily. Um, when Michael was talking about uh, numbers inside of LEARN, we have a virtual school that um, serves about 350 students and we serve them in a um, uh, synchronous uh, delivery model primarily um, with asynchronous resources. We we call that's our version of blended learning. I know it's not the conventional version, but uh, when we say we talk about blended, we we refer to the fact that we're uh, delivering our our courses online in real time to these 350 students, um, and then we support that with a lot of asynchronous resources and, uh, that are available uh, uh, through our site. However, uh, in terms of the other resources that we have, we have course material and uh, um, about 150 to 200,000 pages of, of, of digital uh, material that are, uh, that are used by teachers throughout the province um, and that are linked right into their classes and uh, in some cases they're, they're downloading them and using them right onto their smart boards um, or their, their interactive whiteboards as they call them here in Quebec. So there's, there's a, a great deal of usage and we have about 150,000 uh, students and teachers throughout the province who use that, uh, uh, those resources in that uh, particular format in the, in the synchronous format. Um, one of the interesting things that's happening right now in uh, Quebec is that, uh, as Michael said, there are no, um, uh, there's no legis existing legislation. However, uh, with all of the cutbacks lately, the school boards have decided that they can't wait on the, uh, the ministry to come up with anything. And so they're, they put forward a proposal to the ministry for the creation of a, a provincial virtual school, um, which uh, the uh, Ministry of Education quite surprisingly has a uh, has uh, accepted, and they're now looking at uh, um, having a learn uh, pilot a, uh, a provincial uh, a virtual school for them. Maybe this September, if it's not this coming September 13th, it'll be September 14th. But uh, the interesting thing is that it's obviously um, uh, motivated primarily as a uh, uh, measure to offset uh, budget cuts uh, that have been quite radical in the past, where they were able to keep uh, small schools with a Two, three hundred students in the school uh, to keep them open. Um, they can no longer justify the, these uh, um, schools, so they are now looking for options and alternatives. And one of the uh, the options that we've been putting forward and suggesting to them was the creation of of a, of a provincially run um, virtual school, and that's been accepted uh, and quite favorably, uh, quite surprisingly, by the ministry. Uh, ironically, as we're going ahead with all this, there still is no um, no legislation, no no rules, uh, no um, parameters established. And I think what it's, what's more than likely going to happen is that it will uh, it'll happen a little bit on an ad hoc basis. Uh, um, they're going to start to see how things go, and then they'll 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 start to uh, try to apply uh, constraints, if you want, and rules and regulations. But uh, um, we're at an interesting crossroads right now in Quebec. The, um, the model for our virtual uh, school is also going to remain a, a, um, one based on the LEARN model, which is a, a primarily a synchronous uh, real-time delivery, uh, and it will focus uh, uh, almost exclusively at the high school level. Um, and, and for us, that's from grade 7 to grade 11, because after grade 11, they go to a community colleges here where they do a grade 12 and 13. But uh, we'll be focusing on grade 7 to 11. So that's what's new and happening here in, in Quebec. And uh, interesting and exciting times for us. I'll pass it over to you, Vince. Hi, <clears throat> sorry, can you hear me okay? <clears throat> Got a bit of a frog in my throat sitting here just. <laughs> um, I, I'm actually coming to you from uh, Namibia. Uh, the southern part of Africa right now. I'm actually here on a uh, government mission. <clears throat> um, because of our particular programming that we offer, not only in high school but in college, we've been asked to actually participate in some um, government uh, not-for-profit adventures and, and so forth here in, in from Canada. And um, <clears throat> that's why I'm currently here right now, actually doing some some work with these people here with a, a, an existing college down here. But back at uh, in Saskatchewan, um, we actually have, um, um, uh, we've been in existence since 2005, 
And we've seen a lot of changes over the years in particular. Um, I mean, my, our primary focus has been on the First Nation side, and, and Michael is, is correct that back about three, four years ago, actually, the, the ministry got out of the, the education business in terms of distance education, um, and, and, and partly because um, there wasn't any real consistency between the, the actual courses that were being put online. They were seconding various uh, uh, teachers from various school districts to actually uh, create different courses. There wasn't any... Uh, continuity between the development of courses. There wasn't one template that was being used. It was uh, it was kind of a free for all, and um, most of the programming was asynchronously delivered. And um, they were actually finding um, that the success rate at the time, and this is this is what motivated the decision at that time. Correspondence course uh, courses that were being run not through distance ed, but just correspondence were get, were we only had about an 8% success rate and their distance learning program was only having about it was about a 20% success rate and um, they were really concerned about the fact that they weren't really seeing a lot of people being successful in the program particularly because what was happening was a lot of the different school divisions had a policy in place that said if you uh, have a student who is uh, currently enrolled in a um, um, uh, in your school district and they have a, a spare, um, they're not allowed to have a spare and so what they did is they just signed them up to the distance learning program and gave them a, an add-on course and most of those kids really didn't take it very seriously and just kind of dropped out of the system uh, um, a, as a result. So the, the ministry just kind of looked at it and said, you know, we're not really providing a service that we think is quality in terms of make, ensuring that students are being successful. Um, and, and maybe partly in part because we haven't had a long history of distance learning um, like uh, provinces like Quebec or BC. Um, and, and so as a result, <clears throat> that's how, and prior to that, we were, we were in existence primarily with our First Nations world. Um, there's another, there's another uh, uh, school in Saskatchewan, it's the Saskatoon Cyber School as well, and they, they have... Um, They've been around for a long time, and so essentially the two of our schools actually picked up a lot of the slack and have been delivering a lot of the different programs that are um, being uh, provided within the province. Now, each school division does still have um, their own um, uh, limited online kind of programs uh, where they're offering currently maybe three to five classes for their current their students, um, but we're, in our particular context, we're act actually... Um, uh, reaching out to all the First Nations within Saskatchewan, all reserves, which essentially is 75 different communities. And um, and when you think about our numbers, because we're only focused on the grade 10 to 12, we currently at this point only have 5,000 students that are actually in the high school system within the First Nations world, and we currently have 600 of those students within our population within in the online context. So when you look at the percentages of students that are actually online, within our First Nations world, being that there's only 5,000 and 600 of them with us, um, you know, our, our numbers are pretty interesting in terms of the percentage of students participating in online delivery. And I think that that's a, I think that's a real plus when we think about what um, we're, we've been really promoting the whole concept of uh, equipping our students for the 21st century and making sure that they have uh, the skill sets that are going to prepare them for uh, if they choose to leave, leave the reserves and go into the into a mainstream society and integrate into society, they need to have the, have those skill sets that are going to make them productive and, and successful, particularly even in university and colleges and so forth. Our primary focus was when we began was on the math and sciences because we were, had a reach that was mostly focused on uh, going into areas that are remote that where they were having a difficult time attracting. Uh, qualified teachers uh, into those particular areas, and so as a result, now we're really um, <clears throat> we're seeing that that's not so much the case anymore. We're being we're being asked to provide a, a wide range of courses to a number of schools because they simply feel that there's a tremendous benefit for their students to develop those skill sets in an online capacity, uh, learning to use the computers uh, effectively, and and then uh, the variety of tools that are available as well too. So. And then as a result, then we actually then went beyond that to the college level as well because we saw there was so much success with the with the high school. 
in the upcoming year, just to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up, we're actually going into Alberta next year, <clears throat> and um, and currently in the in the um, uh, we've developed a partnership with Alberta Distance Learning, and then also in addition to that, we're in talks with um, with ANSI. Michael, you're asking about the acronym now. It's AANDC, which is um, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada, and um, <clears throat> we're we're currently in talks with them about the funding arrangement that we will have. We also have a partnership with Wapasco Virtual Collegiate in Manitoba, which has the online system there for First Nations for the entire province as well. And then in addition to that, we're adding on another school as well into Ontario, um, hopefully this upcoming September as well too, that um, we'll branch into. And um, and just sort of the idea would be the the developing an economy of scale, working together, uh, developing courses together. And Michael's right when he makes a comment that we more, have more of a pan-Canadian view. Um, we don't feel that we're necessarily limited to provincial jurisdictions when we, we actually will go along more of the lines of the treaties, uh, which go across boundaries. And as a result, uh, we, we look at things a little bit more from a national standpoint as well. But that's uh, just a quick overview of our, our particular program. Hi, uh, Greg Bitkin out here in beautiful British Columbia. And uh, this is always a, a, a great, great joy to get together with some of our colleagues here. Uh, in fact, uh, we've been working closely with uh, both Michael Canul and with Vince on potentially trying to create a pan-Canadian organization that will help us, uh, you know, in the sharing of our resources across Canada. I mean, um, one of the challenges we face in Canada is the unique distinctiveness between the provinces and their approach to education. And uh, it's my opinion that I think that we can bring a lot of that together uh, in, in particularly in the in this genre, in the genre of online digital uh, distance learning kind of educational opportunities. And so, uh, so again, just a just a great honor to be here with with our colleagues. So uh, Michael uh, Barber was right. We're very regulated here in BC, and that can be a blessing as well as a challenge. Um, but uh, regulation has given definition. Uh, probably more so than any other place in Canada and most places in North America. And as a result of that, we have 70 different programs that are operating, 50 some from various districts, and 20 independent schools that are functioning throughout British Columbia to meet the needs in this particular area. And as, as Michael pointed out, there's well over 12% of the population is engaged, the student population is engaged in some level of um, in some level of um, uh, distance learning, and that doesn't count as well the blended options and digitally supportive options that are now happening as a result of that all over the province. I know that's something that we're very involved in with independent schools, where not just you know have the students in a distance learning relationship, but we can use our our courseware to support classroom. Situations so digitally supported curriculum, with classrooms and things like that. So we're working hard in that genre. Um, the uh, the regulation can be a bit of a challenge though because there's starting to be a little bit more definition on what you can and can't do, and so uh, sometimes ambiguity isn't the bad thing because you have to deal with. Uh, now, government regulations and audits and inspections and all of that, and so we went through an audit and an inspection this year. And um, but it's the nature of the beast, so you yeah, you live with it. Um, we're an independent school, and uh, our primary uh, client is, is the homeschoolers across British Columbia. And uh, next year, we we too will be joining Credenda and Vince's school in Alberta. Um, we're actually there now at, with a campus school program, but uh, we hope to be working with traditional homeschoolers as well as uh, DL or online, fully online learners in the province of Alberta. And uh, and again, we'll be doing that as an independent school. Uh, and so uh, uh, our 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 clientele has been mostly homeschoolers, 
as I said, and distance learners. And this has created, uh, it's interesting when you compare the three different options that you're talking to, you have Learn Quebec, which has become just a tremendous support, digital support to all of Quebec and in parts of Canada and beyond. Then, you know, Vince's work, uh, particularly with uh, First Nations kids, is really remarkable. And, uh, and, and his work, that has also shaped the way that his educational structures and pedagogies have gone as well. So Vince would be, I'd call Vince an evangelist of distance learning, yet with a synchronous model. And you can type something in there if you disagree with me, Vince, but uh, it's definitely evangelist in that regard. We, on the other hand, have really worked hard on the asynchronous processes. And, and so we would create synchronous relationships with our students and our teachers, but we work really hard on our asynchronous uh, curriculum. And this has opened up opportunities for us to use our curriculum and our programs in a number of different areas. And so we've been able to export our programs into other parts of the world, as uh, Michael had said. Uh, we also, um, one of the things that has developed through regulation in British Columbia is what we call cross enrollment. So this means that a student in any high school in British Columbia can take an online course from any uh, distributed learning school and and can do it for credit. So we we have uh, thousands of kids every year that uh, come into our programs, uh, both from public and independent schools, who uh, take a course or two. We're about 2,000 plus kids who are are full time with us, but that part time element also is a great way to 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 reach kids who are just wanting to do kind of a hybrid or blended learning approach to their education in their high school. So um, enough said, I think that uh, uh, British Columbia is, has taken some good direction and it's because I think of the government influence and adoption of this kind of form of education early on that has given us the head start and, and I think uh, Michael pointed out that uh, I think we're the most uh, saturated jurisdiction in North America for for uh, online education and digital support. And uh, and if you look at the high school, it's even, you know, I know he's quoted a 12.5% or 13%, but if you just did high school students, it would be a, a very significant number. Uh, now, I think it's, I mean, it's one of the goals is that every student would have at least one course, uh, you know, in some sort of an online format coming into a more, you know, uh, online world and post-secondary, so I think that's uh, that's been a key kind of directive. So yeah, I'll I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I think the only participant we have here in the audience beyond uh, Rob and um, Jeanette, who are with iNACL, is Leslie, but. Um, I was wondering if either of the three of you have any questions uh, for any of the panelists. So this is Rob. So the um, the three or four of you kind of talked about it. I mean, so it's it's fascinating to see the comparable growth. In across Canada, as in the U.S. and other places as well, one of the things I heard, I think I heard you guys talk about, was kind of the ongoing way that you communicate with each other to move your respective programs forward. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the types of activities you're doing to continue to interact with each other, to compare notes, and to move your respective programs forward, some of those activities along those lines? Yeah, I'll jump in there because I have a question. Is, are, are, is the May meeting even going to come off? I uh, know that uh, uh, I saw that in one of your emails, Michael. Uh, we've been uh, meeting together. We started meeting uh, actually there at INACL and uh, through Michael's session. Um, in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, Michael Barber uh, did, was going to do a, sex, a session and couldn't make it, and so I stepped in, and uh, Michael Canoe was on the on the panel, 
and I think I facilitated it, and uh, he got some people involved in this who were, you know, not just researchers, but, you know, hey, let's do something. And so as a result of that, we had a meeting in Toronto uh, last year, which I think we need to kind of get, get organized this year as well, guys. Um, and uh, both Vince and Michael were very, very involved. And I think probably Vince, Michael, myself, and maybe two or three other colleagues are really the ones who um, uh, have, uh, would be the key guys organizing this and the key stakeholders in that. So uh, we're, we are working on doing something like that. And, uh, you know, when you're trying to organize, you kind of can get stalled on some things, and we're still trying to figure out what we want to be, if we want to what, you know, if we want to be something formal. And what does that look like? I think Vince wants that to be done last week. Um, Michael is uh, a great plotter, and he's kept us accountable. And I'm uh, I'm just excited. So I mean, I don't really have a lot of. I mean, I'm trying to find space on my desk for it, but um, yeah. So I, I think you've got a great group of people here, and and really, Michael Barber was the one that brought us together. So uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, okay. There you go, guys. I'll turn it off. Um, just to add, yeah, I'm looking at. Um, historically, the ministries have actually gotten together. Uh, usually once a year. Um, it's often been in June. Um, it's usually been done through the Council of Ministers of Education, essentially all the folks responsible for distributed learning or distance education. Um, that meeting tends to happen depending upon who's hosting it. So somebody that is really into it, if it's their turn to host, um, it tends to go ahead. Uh, so I know when BC hosts it, when Alberta hosts it, when um, um, Newfoundland has hosted it, it's tended to happen. When other jurisdictions have been responsible, particularly in ones where the ministry isn't quite as actively involved uh, with regulating distance education, it tends not to happen. But again, that's ministry officials. It's not actually practitioners that are in the field doing it. It's basically them getting together and, and comparing notes kind of thing and then looking at, you know, what's working in various provinces. Um, there is no sort of INACO-like organization in Canada. Um, there are a couple of higher ed ones that uh, are looking to have a more of a um, uh, a K-12 presence uh, very much in, in the way that, say, SITE in the U.S. has now got a virtual school in SIG. Um, but beyond that, it's it's been this group that we've, we've informally met on three occasions now, as, as Greg had mentioned, uh, in Toronto last June at the virtual school symposium in October, uh, in British Columbia in February, and our next meeting is in May in Alberta, and then hopefully coming back together somewhere in central Canada again in July. Um, to get everything formalized if if all goes well. Yeah, I was going to add something here from my, my perspective as well. I think one of the things that's really unique in particular with the, the groups, uh, the group of us that are actually meeting, um, most of us actually operate and and as not-for-profits or actually registered charities. Um, when you look at uh, Michael way out in Quebec, he's a not-for-profit. I think that um, uh, Greg and BC, they're not-for-profit as well. We're a, ch a registered charity as well. Um, and I think that what that does is that it it kind of eliminates some of the competitive edge that may may exist in some of the other regions uh, further south into the states where they're actually a for-profit uh, organizations and so forth. And so they're vying for the student population and trying to uh, market themselves and so forth. And we certainly market ourselves and advertise and promote, but we do a lot more sharing of resources and kind of uh, try to see what we can do to kind of collaborate and where we can kind of support each other and bolster each other, each other up a little bit. Um, you know, and it does, yeah, it's true. Um, um, we the thing one of the things that I think it causes us to try to look for solutions to uh, see where we can share resources uh, and and sort of uh, work together as opposed to kind of um, working our own little um, you know uh, sort of silos and so forth and and do things independently. This is Michael Canyon here, Lauren. 
um, I just want to echo a little bit of what Greg and uh, Vincent both said, and, and I, I agree entirely. And I think we were originally motivated by the fact that uh, when we were at INACOL, we were uh, very, very interested and, and uh, enjoyed a uh, great deal of what was going on. But we also recognize that the Canadian reality is different. And, and actually, there, there are 10 Canadian, or I should say, 12 Canadian realities, and you can maybe multiply that or add, uh, add to that. Um, the, our jurisdictions are different. Our our, uh, our challenges are, are are different, and I think we speak um, uh, a different language in some in some areas. So I think uh, while there is no formal organization uh, yet, uh, I'm I'm a firm believer that there's a need for some kind of a, uh, of, a of a structure organization by which we can uh, um, uh, more regularly exchange and 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 uh, collaborate and find ways to share resources. And, and I agree that there's um, there's not that competitive component to uh, a lot of what what we do. We, I think we're all interested in improving our practice, improving the services that we uh, we put out there. And that's why I'm always excited to to speak with Vince and with Greg because uh, what they're doing is always interesting and exciting and and has a Canadian flavor to it. And this is not to uh, uh, it, it just reflects more the Canadian reality as well. So uh, I, I would very much like to see what we're calling uh, our, our uh, COBOL, which is the Confederation for Online Blended Learning, as our informal little group. Uh, I wouldn't mind seeing it uh, structure, become a little more structured and a little more formalized. Uh, I don't know what that will look like. And, it's, and it is hard to, to get something off the ground because we're doing this with no funding and uh, we're doing it a little bit on, uh, strictly on a volunteer basis. But I think there's a, there's a, um, a kind of need for it as well in our in our, uh, our circumstances. I do want to add something here as well too. I don't know uh, the others in, on the panel here may not be aware of this, or maybe are. But like we're finding, um, <clears throat> government in Canada is starting to tighten the belts in terms of the funding piece uh, for all of us federally and provincially. I mean, for example, just in um, um, in Alberta, for Alberta Distance Learning alone, uh, they're seeing almost a 25% uh, almost a 25% cut in terms of their funding for next year, uh, which is really uh, just uh, completely um, kind of off the wall in terms of where some of the governments are going. They're just looking to, to, you know, to cut wherever they can. And um, and so it, it does create some challenges for us as well. I think you know I heard you know Greg was saying there's some challenges in BC as well, and we're finding that more a federal government seems to really um, be taking lots of uh, measures and steps to try to uh, uh, demonstrate efficiencies and 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 education and so forth. Um, and, and in particular, even in our in our Saskatchewan uh, school divisions. All of our director of educations are now actually titled CEOs, and uh, they're no longer directors of education. So they they really are looking at this more as a business model for education to try and see if they can run things a little more efficiently. And 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 so it creates all kinds of challenges for us. And so I think that's why it really is an impetus for a number of us to start looking at how do we share resources and work together and collaborate. And um, so that's just an added thoughts here. Leslie, I don't know if you had any questions or if Rob or Jeanette had any additional ones.
we're seeing other questions, and um, I know we're actually coming up on to uh, the end of the hour anyway. Um, I basically put my slide there, which has uh, my contact information on it. Um, Vince, Greg, and Michael, I, um, I apologize, I actually should have put your email addresses there on another slide as well. So if you could, before we turn off the recording, um, punch your emails into the chat box there so that way if people have specific questions that they'd like to send to you um, directly, they can reach you um, in, in those uh, forms. Um, as Rob mentioned, the um, the uh, recording will be posted to one of the iNACO forms where all of the webinar recordings are, uh, as well as a PDF of the slides. And I'll be posting uh, the slides on my SlideShare account as I do all of uh, my presentations. So, and you can access it there at my uh, website. It should be down on the bottom, I think, left hand side is uh, where you can access my SlideShare. And I'll turn it over to you for any uh, closing there, Rob. Great. Thank you, Michael and team. Uh, fascinating, fascinating information shared about Canada and what's going on across your nation. So I appreciate it so much. Thank you, Leslie, for being here. And I think I'll stop the recording. And